Hello, everybody. How are we? Marvellous. What a packed crowd we've got. We've drawn the curtains. And we've turned all the lights on and we've started the smoke and it's getting very atmospheric indeed. And we're about to do our next live launch. And today's one is a very special one indeed. To help us do this, please welcome to the stage Brett Skingle and Katie Osborne. Hello, chaps. How are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, Good. we're doing well. You're from Opus Camper. We are. Tell us a bit about Opus Camper. Well, it's a company based in um, Ipswich, um, and uh, we sell um, the um, Opus and uh, the Pold Opus. At the moment, yeah, yes. and, and of course, it's the Folding Camper, and, and that's available at this show right now. There's one you've been selling all week. Yes, the but, Air Opus. But the one behind there isn't that, is it? No. No. But before... <laughs> Before we go into that, let's just take a look at sort of the genesis and the evolution of, of the folding camper. So here we see it. That's it in all its glory. Not the one behind the curtain, though. No. Absolutely uh not. No. What, we, what we've got here, essentially, um, is a trailer-like structure, um, which essentially um, folds out um, to create a luxury sixth berth folding camper. Um, so it's a kind of world first in terms of leisure vehicle. Um, and it takes around two minutes to inflate the canvas itself. Okay, okay. And uh, as you can see, is that? Am I right in saying that's your that's your little boy? It is. Yes. Yeah. We, we we were pulled into the uh, um, the marketing video, which is great fun in Rendleton Forest. Which is really um, interesting to see that it's a, it's a golf. You know, it's not it a is, massive it, car, yes, is it? You don't need a, a large vehicle to to tow the Opus. Um, a golf, um, no bigger than a golf. Okay. Um, some of our customers have have a um, a mini. Um, and it's it's very easy to tow. That's the beauty of the Opus. Um, is that it and it fits in most regular garages. Right. Um, and because you can see over the top of it, yeah, it really is no problem to tow. Now, now some people here, I'm sure, will be experts on folding campers or trailer tents. Uh, you'll you'll know how they work. But for some people, they may have never seen one before. So let's just take a look at the next slide, just to give you an idea of of what you end up with. So tell us about that. I, th I think what strikes a lot of people when they walk inside the Opus is the light and the space. Um, there's a lot of wows on the stand. It really is great to see, especially at the NEC. It's a perfect opportunity to showcase the product. Um, so people walk in, they look around and go, wow, this is a bit of, is, is a TARDIS. Um, because of the light panels in the, in the, in the, in the roof um, and the height, there's a lot of height. So you do get that real feeling of space um, over sort of traditional folding campers. And also, of course, it's the, the speed of setup with the Air Opus. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's no, no poles. You just press a button and up it goes. Oh, really? It's that straightforward? It is that w easy. And are we going to see that, hopefully? We are. Very we shortly. Are. Yes. Let's, mm. ke let's keep moving on. Okay, so this is sat inside. I'm guessing that converts into a bed as well, where they're sat there. Yeah, absolutely. So inside the Air Opus, um, we have two fixed double beds, one at either end. Um, the, the beauty is that they are fixed, so they're always there. Um, and then the seating area actually, actually doubles up as an additional double bed as well. Um, so the main camper itself can actually sleep up to six people. Wow, okay. Okay, that looks lovely inside as well. It's got high spec. Mm. Your kids playing swing ball there? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, they enjoy. And then here what we have um, is the additional air awning. So the main point for us is obviously to create flexibility for our customer base. Um, so the ability to transform the Opus from a four to a 10 berth camper, um, but essentially using the same frame. Um, so here we're showing the air awning, which uses a single point inflation. Um, and essentially you use the inbuilt electric pump that's already in the Opus. Um, attach it and hey presto, the awning within kind of five minutes is up and ready to go. Inside we've also got um, cooking facilities. Um, so we've got a two burner hob, we've got pumped water, we've got a microwave, we've got a heater for the chilly nights. 
That's yeah, and that looks great. And we're actually going to. We've also got an outside cooking area. We need to say at this point, don't we? As well. Yes. Yeah. Which we'll be testing out shortly. Okay. Just want to ask you about the air thing. Actually, the air technology, the durability, any sort of potential issues with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a well-tested technology now in the awning field. Mm. Um, and obviously, over the past three years, the transition has been quite apparent from pole to air. Um, obviously, because of our kind of background in terms of everything being made in house, we were obviously really keen to keep up with that transition. Um, and for us, it was kind of inevitable at some point to move over. So the technology that we use is actually triple layer air technology. So essentially, there's three layers inside each of the air tubes. Okay. So even it in windy conditions, it, yeah. it coats really well. It's, it's, it's a very sturdy structure. But so Okay, but just to be clear, th th this is on, on, on road, isn't it? This is, yeah, this, this is, is on actually yeah, on road. But mode. this is off road. It is indeed. Yeah, and what's the difference between off road and on road in, that re in, in respect of the products? Absolutely. So the main differences um, are, as you mentioned, the cooking area. So on the on road, we have the cooking facilities inside. On the off road, we've got a rather exciting kitchen. Both of them have a huge load carrying capacity on the roof, so there's space for all sorts of adventure toys. The chassis are very different, and therefore the weights are very different. So obviously the on-road is potentially suited to more smaller everyday hatchback vehicles. Um, and then we also have other features such as suspension, tires, all sorts. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, the, the off-road also has a, a shower facility as well. Which is always needed. Wow, okay, this looks like fun. Um, <laughs> a lot of eating, yeah. <laughs> So in terms of the stages for Opus, this was our first development. So Opus actually started in 2013, and we started by selling a polled variant which had seven poles. For us, um, the, the first success, if you like, was appearing on The Apprentice um, and becoming the winning product for that episode. That's kind of where we knew that we were onto something good in terms of the Opus. It was our first kind of public reception to the product. We sold the Opus, the, the traditional polled opus right up until 2017 and then it was the transition through to air where we were thinking why can we not bring this air technology into a folding camper um, essentially using the same armadillo like structure um, and still creating that sense of height that sense of height inside because we have an in-house design team everything is designed here in the uk and our design team started working in mid-2016 on the original concept. So immediately we knew that it was something which we would want to bring to production. Then we worked through the over the past nine, 12 months before we brought it to market in March through a series of different prototypes, testing, ensuring the durability of the air tubes, making sure everything was up to the same standard that we provide on our polled opus. And then we get ready for the production model. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? Where was that? Somewhere fantastic. That's at a lovely bay in Cornwall, just outside Tintagel. That's absolutely fantastic. It's quite amazing. And as, as you said, Katie, it's the, it's the, the TARDIS yes. aspect. Yes. I think that's what really strikes people. And, and the adaptability of it. I mean, that one, as you can see, we've unzipped the sort of the... the um, uh, the, the front doorway and window out, um, but you, so you can have it open, you can have it closed, you can have front skirts, you can have side skirts, um, and an, the awning, of course, which doubles the space. But if you want a, a quick setup, then you know the the um, main Opus um, can sleep six, um, so you don't always have to have the awning. No. Um, it's it's very adaptable. Wow, I've Everybody. got so, so many more so many more questions and so much to, to look at, and obviously we're going to do the reveal shortly. But before we do that, we've got a short film to show you. Wow, okay, I think it's time to see it in the flesh. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please put your hands together for the off-road Opus Camper. Wow. 
Wow, okay. So um, a couple of your colleagues there are now going to undergo the process of, of, of the transformation. Uh, while they do that, we've still got a few more slides we can look at as well. But my first question is, wh where are Opus... Where, where are they sold, Opus Campers, all across the UK and yeah, abroad? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Opus was conceived in the UK, um, and actually we have a, back when it was first started in 2013, our team members have kind of spread across the world, if you like. So um, we have a headquarters in Australia now as well. Um, we have a headquarters in the US, based in California. Um, from our UK base, we also um, distribute via Europe. Um, so we have dealers in Norway, Switzerland, wow. Belgium. Quite a widespread of coverage. Just look, watching the guys now, they've just opened, they've opened up the two sides. A a anything technical we need to know about here that's going on? Not really. I mean, in terms of the process, um, the way it would work, obviously, first of all, you would put the corner steadies down. Um, we then have the bed clamps, which essentially release the hydraulic struts for the beds. Um, on our off-road concept that we have here, the beds are simply supported at the front and the back. And then... After they've done that section there, the fun section comes where the inflate button comes into play. Okay, and, and how, lo so how long does that take, the, the inflate section? Around two minutes. And that's it? Um, yes, yes. So I'm, I'm guessing that you're not having to peg out, are you? There's none no, of that. that's the beauty. Is that it is very, very quick and easy. Yes. Yeah, and, and if it's raining, you can get inside quickly. Get inside quickly, then, yeah. but also get it down quickly, get it up quickly, move on if yeah. you want to move on. Yeah. It's interesting that, that some people may have come to this show not thinking about maybe having a folding camper, perhaps. Mm. And and what would you say to them in, in relation to maybe looking at a high-end tent or, or possibly a camper, um, as in a camper van? Uh, what would you say about this kind of lifestyle? Well, I mean, it's as, as well as easy setup, it's it's also about, I mean, yeah, w the, it, it's... Being able to be adaptable. I mean, all, all the people you can get get in the in the awning and in the in the main opus, and also putting your bikes on top. The, having the, the solid lids makes a big difference. So you can you can put roof boxes on top, you can put kayaks on top. So it's it's great for adventurous families who who want to go with a lot of kit because um, you can fit. There are there is quite a lot of storage inside underneath the seating area. Um, so yeah, it's it's really ticks a lot of boxes, as well as being easy to tow. Um, because I think, you know, what scares some people about getting caravan or motorhome is that, is that it can, I mean, certainly in caravan, it can be difficult in the wind. Um, but this, because it's low, um, can, yeah, is, is a dream to tow, as, as to quote uh, some of our customers. Yeah, absolutely. It, it looks like it. Now, this, I'm guessing, though, it's, it's bigger. So, therefore, we couldn't tow it with a, with a, with a Golf or a, need a, a Fiesta vehicle. or yes, whatever. Definitely. I don't think, yeah. Right, yeah. so, so what kind of vehicle would you be looking for? Well, You'd be looking at something potentially like the Nissan X-Trail, um, something along those lines. Um, the Opus itself, in terms of the concept, actually weighs 1,200 kilos, um, even our off-road concept here. So it's still m uh, within the lightest of caravans in terms of the berthage that you're getting from it. Um, but yes, definitely it's something to kind of bear in mind in terms of the on-road and the off-road availability that we have. Yeah, and, and so let's just go through some of the advantages of, of, of buying of buying a folding camper. I mean, what would you say? I mean, obviously, f fuel consumption and visibility when towing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, storage space in terms of our on-road model, it fits in a standard size garage at your home. Um, a lot of our customers will travel across Europe, so you're looking at a trailer cost in rather than a caravan cost in terms of ferry. Um, as you've mentioned, fuel consumption and generally just storage, to be honest. Um, and as much as anything else, the one thing that Kai put people are amazed by, as we keep mentioning, is the head height. So in terms of a camper van, obviously you're limited, it's great, but at a site, if you want to go out somewhere for the day, you're packing that down. This is kind of a vehicle, like a base, if you like, which stays, and you've still got your vehicle there to travel around in. Yeah, well, as you can see, it's starting It's starting to go up now. And what I'd notice about this being the off-road one, it's, it's, quite, it's quite blokey, isn't it? It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very manly. Yeah. Yeah. So so okay. So so where do where, 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 I mean, it's, where, yeah. where do you see this? With um, well, as as the title suggests, yeah, I mean, off road. Somebody who likes yeah. adventure, um, and has a big vehicle, and and yeah, likes something more solid, and yeah, and yeah, versatile off road. Yeah. yeah. They started in Australia. They yes, they're doing very well over there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, our, our European dealers are very keen in terms of Norway. Um, being able to get this product kind of to market, as well as Switzerland. Um, there's quite a big calling for this kind of product in, uh, in areas like that. Where you could do wild camping, yeah. 
Oh right. So in terms, yeah. So in terms of the, the, the sort of the, the gas side of things and all that, take us through that. How all that all, how that all works. Yeah, I mean, we've pretty much got all that covered. We'll talk you guys around it in a minute when we pop down there. But we've got inbuilt water. We've got plenty of leisure batteries in there. We've got space for plenty of gas canisters. So essentially, you can be away from a base for quite a period of time and not have to worry about anything. Yeah, so it looks like we're almost nearly there now. It's amazing. As you will see, ladies and gentlemen, we've pulled out the kitchen area, which kind of, I suppose, shows you the edge of the footprint of what would be the awning space as well. Yes, which um, doubles, the, doubles the space you get. Yeah. yeah, and again, for people that aren't, aren't familiar with, with, with this, this type of structure, the, the potential of what, what you can have on a campsite, as we can see here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So here would show the configurations. Um, as we mentioned, we start with the same base tub on all of our models. So if we look at the four berth, obviously we've got the two fixed double beds at each end. As we mentioned earlier, the six berth uses the seating area for an additional two. And then with the awning added on, essentially with that can sleep a further two in each bedroom annex. So you can have a total of up to 10 sleeping in there and still a large living space. Yeah, and, and if you were camping in the middle of winter, um, there's a lot of warmth to be had, though, isn't there, inside? There's a built-in heater, yes, and you can also get a roof lining that sort of traps the hot air in. So, yes, it really is built for sort of all weathers. It's incredible. So we're going to get uh, Steve, our chef, out uh, in a bit, um, and he's, he's all, uh, uh, raring to go at the back somewhere. St where is he, Steve Groves? Anyway, he's, he's, there he is. He's, he's, <laughs> he's watching from the back now, and Steve's going to cook us um, one of his f uh, famous dishes. Um, how, how sort of in terms of a kitchen, how luxurious is that for? for a d I mean, I'm guessing it's like nothing else, really, isn't it? The, it the you'd, you'd of, of, of any of your competitors, you, that, that's that's luxury. It's quite unusual. Yeah, yeah, it's quite unique. Um, it's a four burner. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the main advantages of it being an off-road vehicle is the ability to being able to stop anywhere on the roadside and essentially cook a meal. So what we have to remember is sometimes in these European countries or Australia, for example, there's vast distances where these people are traveling. So to be able to access the fridge, the cooking facilities whilst on the road means that essentially they can camp happier for longer. And when you went out with, with, away with the kids and stuff, obviously you, you, you felt the full benefit of that. Yes, we had a great time. Um, it, we spent a few nights um, uh, making the uh, Aeropus uh, video. Um, and yeah, the kids really enjoyed their time um, in the Opus, in the beds, you know, chilling out, reading. Um, it's just, you know, it doesn't matter what the weather is because you've got the light and the height and the space. It's just a lovely, you know, place to spend time in, really. And, and in terms of where you would use one of these, are any, any campsites are, are, re are receptive to these? Yes, any standard pitch. Yeah, you don't need anything special for the Opus, yeah. I've got a, I've got a question here for you that um, someone's asked me twice. Is what if I require more space and flexibility between living and sleeping space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as the configurations we just showed, um, the, the space is as flexible as you wish it to be. Some of our owners will use the awning space as a washroom space or as a wardrobe hanging space. Um, there's flexibility in terms of that. If you want to sleep even more, the middle section of the awning can accommodate more and you've still obviously got your cooking facilities and everything to hand. Um, inner bed tents are available for both the awning and the opus, but it doesn't necessarily have to be used as a bedroom area. So overall, what would you say are the advantages of buying a folding camper? For me, in terms of its insurance costs we have to look at, it's in terms of um, fuel economy, it's the fact of being able to come home on a Friday, know everything's packed in there, hitch up to your car and drive away. It's the fact potentially of having a vehicle which is already able to tow a folding camper, um, and just the flexibility of lending it to friends and family, getting everyone involved, and um, mm. getting kind of creative with it. Absolutely, that's an amazing picture. Where was that taken? Yeah, not that that's really down yeah. under. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not Suffolk then. No, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately not. No, we've got a lovely view of the River Orwell from um, our offices, but um, don't get sunsets like that. You have, yeah. You guys, are, you guys are based out in Suffolk, and uh, and actually, uh, Steve, our chef, he's he's an Ipswich fan, um, and uh, there seems to be a big Suffolk connection actually. So yeah, m maybe you should get him down for another cooking session after today. But it. I think we are ready to go. So, um, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready, Steve? Okay, so without any further ado, please welcome to the stage, Master Chef, Chef, uh, chef Extraordinaire, uh, uh, our today's uh, guest chef at the show. Please welcome Steve Groves. Come down, guys. Hi, 
Hi, Steve. Hi, How are you? Good to see you again. That's such a firm handshake. Hey, buddy. How's it going? Very good, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, Steve, we're going to sort of um, hand over to you, uh, but while you're getting yourself sorted, uh, we're just going to do a bit, of a, a bit of a tour of the van anyway. So, guys, just uh, take take it away yeah absolutely so in terms of a bit of a run round what we've got here is a large storage locker at the front which is where our pull out fridge sits so it's simply on a lever system so super super easy to use next up we've got our control panel here which where we were talking about earlier the inbuilt water tanks there's sensors built in we've got a front and a rear water tank both for pump water um, we've got lighting inside we've got sockets for the fridge um, this here is our inflate button as you saw the guys demonstrate earlier then if we turn around here, we've got the off-road tires and suspension underneath. We've got the pull-out kitchen, which obviously features pumped water sink, external lighting. We've got a 12 volt there if you want to plug in lighting in the awning. We've also got the four burner hob, cutlery drawers, and also a prep area. Wow, beautifully done. And around the back, is there anything else that we've possibly... Around the back is where you would find the external shower. So there's an external shower point if you've got kind of adventure toys to hose off or dogs or even yourself. Yes, That's also where you would um, fill the water tank. So there's two water tank locations. There's another gas point around there if you want an external barbecue outside of the awning. So again, flexibility to use kind of all areas of the camper. Great stuff. And, and inside inside the van, we've got we've obviously got two two beds yeah absolutely so we've got the built-in steps into the door then we've got the triple layer air beam technology that we're talking about here we've got roof lights up inside we've got a seating area all the way around here on the off-road on the on-road version sorry the kitchen area as you would see on our stand takes up this section here so the off-road gives a larger internal space and then you've got your kind of luxury mattresses double size beds either end Fabulous. And just so people know, when can we actually get one of these? Because they're not quite available yet, are they? They're not indeed. No, that's that's the major question. Um, we're hoping mid-2018. That's the plans for us. Um, again, in terms of the cycle of on-road um, to off-road, we had a kind of a 12-month turnaround from the pole to air, and we're hoping for a similar turnaround on this product. Well, it's fabulous that you could showcase it here. Yes. It's a great opportunity to, to show all, all the products, really. Um, but just keep an eye on our, our website um, and get an update there. Great stuff. Okay, so Steve, uh, wh what do you think? What's your first impression? It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, if I was going to cook outside, then this is the kind of setup I'd like. I mean, it's nearly as well equipped as my kitchen at home. So. <laughs> okay, well, away you go. So we're going to cook through uh, a dish. It's kind of inspired um, by a, a very French pancake called a soccer pancake. Um, it's a chickpea pancake. It's from Nice in France. Um, we're going to give it a slightly kind of Mexican feeling. We're going to serve it uh, essentially like a taco. Um, so we're going to start with our mackerel. I've just got some lovely mackerel fillets. I mean, mackerel's one of my favourite fish. I think when it's um, when you get some really good fresh mackerel, there's nothing quite like it. Um, it's got a really quite a delicate flavour. I, I actually prefer it when it's kind of very lightly cooked um, and even raw. I think um, when it when it becomes too cooked, then it can be a little bit more fishy. Um, and you just want to kind of enhance the freshness, really. So to start with, we're going to give it a very light, dry cure. Um, and we're going to use for that some salt and sugar. And it seems like quite an excessive amount of salt and sugar. Um, but we are going to wash that off later. And you want roughly equal amounts of, of both. Um, what the dry curing does, it just draws out a little of the excess moisture in the fish. Intensifies the flavour, firms up the flesh slightly. And like I said, well, I like to serve it slightly underdone. That kind of um, light curing really kind of helps the texture on that. And you could do this with other fish as well. It works really well for um, trout, salmon, uh, cod even. Fish that are quite high in moisture. It just helps kind of, like I say, just draw out a little bit of moisture. Just pop that to one side. Once you've sprinkled on the salt and the sugar on there, we'll leave that for about 20 minutes. Um, just let it do its thing. Like I say, it will lightly cure. Um, and we'll move on to our salad. So... Actually, we'll keep that board there, but take this knife. The salad we're going to do is a, it's a nice kind of fresh salad. We're going to use some fennel. Um, that nice kind of aniseed flavour works really well with fish. We're going to use a little bit of shallots, some lemon, some chilli, and some lovely fresh herbs. We'll just slice the shallot first. Just split that in half. Just slice it across really nice and thin. You want to go as, as thin as possible so you haven't got kind of big chunks of raw shallot 
Um, and we're just going to, again, just a little bit of salt to this. And the salt on the shallot will actually just help soften the shallot slightly, sweeten it up. Now I'm not sure which one of these is salt and which one is sugar, so I'm going to have to have a little try. It's definitely the salt. Okay, so just a little bit of the salt on there. And we do this bit in advance so that the salt actually has time to draw out some of the moisture of the, uh, the shallot. And we'll add to that a little bit of fennel. So fennel is really nice, kind of served raw. It's got a real nice crunch to it, as well as that nice aniseed flavour that I spoke about. And we want to slice this really thin. Now you can, you can do this on a mandolin or you can use your knife just to get really kind of thin shavings. If it's too chunky, then it's just, uh, it'll be quite a dominant flavor. I'm always a bit more fearful of my fingers on a mandolin, but especially when people are watching. So we'll just put that fennel in there as well. We'll add some lemon juice. We'll add a little bit of zest as well. So the flavor from lemon, so much flavour in the zest, so we add a bit of zest to that as well. The acid from the lemon juice will also soften up the fennel, will soften up the shallot. Just getting lots of flavour in there. Nice bit of juice. That will also kind of help form our dressing a little bit later. We'll pop those back on there. And again, like I say, we want to just allow this to sit for a little while as well. Just give it a little mix so that the salt and the, uh, the lemon juice is nicely distributed. And the acid and the lemon will also soften up the vegetables. We don't want them to soften up too much. We want them to obviously retain a nice amount of bite um, and plenty of flavour. So whilst we're waiting for that, we'll move on to our pancake. So like I say, it's a chickpea pancake. Uh, it's made from chickpea flour or gram flour. Um, it's also the flour they use to make poppadoms. Um, so it'll be more familiar to people in that sense. And you want equal quantities by volume, roughly, of uh, gram flour and water. So it's a really simple recipe. Uh, it's good as well because it's gluten-free. So you get a lot of gluten-free guests at the restaurant nowadays. So I think um, having options like this work really well. Just whisk those two together so that we have no lumps. And quite often in France, they'll cook this in like a, a wood-fired oven, so you get a nice kind of wood smoke that kind of imparts a bit of flavour as well. So we're just going to cook it in a pan, but if you do have a, a fire going as well, that's another option. And these pancakes are generally, again in France, they're quite thick generally. Um, and they'll be served just with a bit of olive oil or a, a nice kind of dip that you can just kind of dip them into. Um, we're going to use it, as I said, like a taco. Just got a little bit of olive oil, about a tablespoon. Mix that through. And then a little bit of garlic. If I can see where I moved that to. Just over it. So we're going to crush the garlic. Quite a good tip, actually, for crushing garlic is if you um, use the back of the knife, don't be tempted to hold your knife like that, like some people do. Use the back of the knife and just go across the garlic, and that will crush the garlic rather than cutting it. All we need. And then just go over it with a sharp edge the other way, and you get quite a nice, finely crushed garlic. Pop that into our pancake mix. Put that out of the way. Give that another mix. Okay, with our batter done, we'll move over to the hob. We'll get our frying pan on. You want a good non-stick frying pan for this. Or a kind of cast iron skillet works quite well as well. We'll get that nice and hot. We'll put a little bit of olive oil in there, just the light olive oil. We don't want extra virgin olive oil because it will it will burn quite easily and it's a bit of a waste. We'll just, the oil we've put in there, I'm just going to wipe that around with some kitchen paper so we don't have too much excess oil. We just want 
quite a small amount. And we can use that to rub around again if we do another one. So we'll get this nice and hot. Not too far off. Whilst we're waiting for that, I'm just going to chop my chilli for the salad. So the chilli just gives a really nice kind of kick of heat, really. And again, I just want nice thin slices. If you don't like it too hot, then you can remove the seeds. I like to leave the seeds in. Um, these kind of larger red chilies don't tend to be crazy hot anyway, so I like it a little bit fiery. Mix that through. Okay, we'll come back to the, uh, the frying pan, should be ready to go. down there and we just want to just like you would in the other pancake really just let that spread out around the pan and we want to get it so it just starts to color on the underside it will start to become a little bit crispy as well which kind of gives you a really nice kind of uh, nice bit of texture to the dish um, and through the middle it'll still be quite soft so you've got a kind of nice kind of Variants in textures. Good. I'm also just going to pop on this hob here. And this is going to cook our mackerel on here. I'm going to cook it directly on a wire rack over the top of the, uh, the gas burner. Just so we kind of get a nice charring on the skin. I think with, um, with mackerel and oily fish especially, it's really nice when you've got a kind of slightly charred skin. You get that kind of barbecue smoky flavour. So that's what we're after with that. Okay, we'll just have a look at this pancake. Flip that over. Let's get nice and crispy on that side. A bit of colour on the other side and then we'll uh, pop that out. That's going to get nice and hot. With our mackerel, these are very quite thin fillets, so they might take a little bit less than the 20 minutes we said. So I think they're okay now. And what it's done is just, like I said, it firms up the flesh slightly. It makes it kind of, um, makes it, from my, my point of view, a lot more pleasant to eat when it's slightly undercooked. And I am going to serve it quite undercooked. I'm just popping those into some cold, clean water. What you don't really want to do when you're washing off salt and stuff from fish is put it under the tap. A lot of people kind of put it straight under the tap and then actually the, the force of the water will start to damage the flesh of the fish. We want to keep it nice and intact. And these fillets have been uh, pin-boned, so they've got none of the small bones inside them. There's another way to pin-bone mackerel fillets, actually. If you cut either side of the, the pin-bone to run down the centre, we V-cut either side of that, and then um, you can just slide them all out. But when you've got really fresh fish and you put it directly over a hot heat, what will happen with, um, with these fillets is they'll curl up. If we V-cut the bones out the middle, they'll actually fold in half and make it very hard for us to kind of crisp up the skin. Anyone go fishing for mackerel? Yeah? They endorse it, very nice. At Weymouth or something like that. Very good. Obviously, if you can, uh, if you can go out and catch them yourself and then uh, come back and cook them up, that's even better. And obviously, super fresh. It's got a nice colour on that. I think mackerel fishing is a really satisfying type of fishing as well. You can obviously uh, get quite a good yield off it, can't you? Okay, so we'll just pull our pancake out. We'll cook one more of those. Okay, so I've just dried off the mackerel fillets with uh, a bit of kitchen paper. Don't leave them sat on the kitchen paper because that curing process makes the skin uh, of the flesh as well go quite tacky. So if you leave it sat on the kitchen paper, it will start to stick. Um, but once we've got it to that stage, we're just going to take um, a nice sharp knife and we're just going to score the skin at kind of two millimetre roughly in like intervals. 
And by scoring it kind of so much, it's going to help us get the skin crispy very quickly. So I'm just I'm going into the flesh very slightly. I'm not going to go into it too much. I want to end up with a concertina of mackerel. Flip that over. Trim the very tail part off. Obviously, the more practice you have, the quicker you can get with this. Just wash your fingers. Okay, we'll pop a little bit of olive oil onto the skin. We don't need to season this again. Obviously, we put that salt and sugar on at the beginning, so that's enough. Now the pancake is done. Pan off to the side. Okay, so we'll just rub that oil in. And so I've got this wire rack over here heating up. I'm just going to pop the mackerel straight onto there. Like I said, I want a good charring of the skin. You'll start to smell the kind of the skin charring, and that kind of oil from the mackerel is really uh, really good when it just kind of Singes and you get that flavour on there. You can also do this with a blowtorch. You could do it on a barbecue. Um, at the restaurant, we actually cook it with a blowtorch. Okay, so we want it slightly blackened, and that's not just me making excuses. This way it does make a right mess of your Opus camper, I've got to say, but I might not get invited to that, uh, that trip to Suffolk now. The remaining ingredients for our salad, I said earlier we've got some lovely herbs here, so we've got some mint, some basil, um, a little bit of dill as well, all flavours that complement the fish nicely. If it goes up in flames, join me, please tell me. Okay, a little bit of mint, some lovely fresh basil. So we've got a nice crispy skin, slight kind of charring around the edges. But the flesh on this side is still very much undercooked. And that's how we want it. We want to keep it really nice and um, really nice and fresh. And then we hope it lifts off of these little wire racks. Might be easier actually to flip that over. If I was doing this with a with a, a thicker fillet of fish, so if you had like a nice piece of salmon or something like that, you would just kind of sear it off on there and then maybe turn it over into a pan just to kind of cook the other side slightly. But where these are nice and thin, works really well like this. The skin's really nice and crispy. It's got a nice kind of charring on it. Take a little bit of dill. And just kind of quite roughly chop these herbs, just... Slice them across, don't go too fine with it. When you're chopping herbs, you want a nice sharp knife so you're not kind of bruising the herbs as you're chopping. Okay, let's make a lovely salad. We use a little bit of olive oil. 
And along with the lemon juice that we put in there earlier, that's going to create a nice kind of dressing on our salad. It's really nice and fresh, this. It's got good acidity, which with the rich kind of oily fish just works beautifully. Get some of that chilli on there, otherwise uh, tapir number two is going to be a spicy one. Just going to slice the fish actually into three, just so we can kind of spread that out on there. salad a few bits of fresh dill just to garnish that again the freshness of that herb really kind of benefits the dish and then the idea with these is uh, to fold them up like a taco like I said and uh, very messily eat them so that is our uh, fantastic Mackerel and a fennel soccer pancake taco. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Steve. Now so you have to eat it. So, so, Brett and Katie, would you like to come and try some now? Is that all right? Absolutely. Come, come, come over and uh, join us. A pleasure to cook in this kitchen, then. It is. It's, uh, it's a breeze. I did yeah. it far quicker than I was expecting to do it, to be honest. It was, uh, <laughs> if anyone wants your recipe, Steve, can they, can they get a hold of that? How, how do they do that? Uh, this recipe actually isn't on my website at the moment, but um, there are other recipes on the website, and the soccer pancake one will certainly be going up. So that's um, stevegrovechef.co.uk. Fabulous. And if anybody wants to try your cooking uh, on any other day, they can come to your restaurant. Absolutely, yeah. Parliament Square. We're open Monday to Friday, so yeah, any, uh, any Monday to Friday, come on down. And there are campsites, actually. There's one in Abbey Wood in London. There's one at Crystal Palace. So you can, you can hook up there and you can jump in a black cab. There's usually people <laughs> camping on Parliament Square anyway. So oh, there is that as well. well. Okay, so um, shall we try some? Yes, please. Um, and in the meantime, if anybody would like well, to come and have and a picture with Steve um, or um, ask him any questions about food, but at the same time, if anyone would like to come over um, and have a look and just have a, have a look around and, and just ask some questions about the Opus Camper, then please do as well. But for now, Steve, we'll see you again at 3 o'clock, won't we? We will. We're going to do Gorgeous. some cooking over in our, in our big kitchen over there. Cool. So we're going to cook some steak. We are. Steak and eggs. Fantastic. So we'll be doing that later on. Um, and then coming up at 2.15, we've also got the Grey Gappers. Uh, as a, a couple who went away for 18 months all around Europe. They're here at 2.15 to talk to us all about that. But for now, if you want to come and have a look at the food, come and have a chat with Steve, or come and have a chat with the chaps from Opus Camper, please do. Thank you. Delicious. Mm.